Deixa eu só pôr para gravar rapidamente. Boa tarde a todos. Mais um encontro do Tiaços. É, hoje, recebendo uma figura extremamente importante do nosso campo, do campo da psicologia arquetípica, mas fundamentalmente do campo dos estudos da alma. Thomas Moore, Thomas, prazer enorme te receber. Te peço desculpas por não ter te recebido anteriormente, estava terminando um seminário, mas eu soube que você foi muito bem, recebeu as boas-vindas, tanto da Luciana Chimenez, quanto da nossa queridíssima Isa. Vou apresentar o Thomas Moore para quem já não conhece, né? acho difícil que alguém não o conheça, mas eu quero fazer uma apresentação formal. Thomas Moore é o autor do best-seller número um do New York Times, Cuide de Sua Alma, além de 25 outros livros sobre alma e espírito. É PhD em estudos religiosos pela Universidade de Syracuse e possui graduação em teologia, teoria musical e composição. Ele é psicoterapeuta há 40 anos. Era amigo próximo e colega de James Hillman, que, junto com Jung, inspiraram sua escrita e prática. O livro mais recente de Thomas é Terapia, Terapia da Alma. Ele também escreve ficção e vive na Nova Inglaterra, não muito longe das assombrações de Emerson, Turro, Emily Dixon, que também o inspiram. Thomas, um prazer enorme te receber. Não sei se é a sua primeira vez falando para o público brasileiro. Separei aqui alguns livros seus é, para apresentar para o público brasileiro. Cuide de sua alma, livro clássico. Né? Acho que pouca gente... <risos> Essa é a edição brasileira? É, que coisa! Eu li esse livro em 1996. 94, bastante tempo. The Planets Within, né? que é um livro também que eu gosto muito. Dark Heroes. Esse livro nós vamos começar em agosto, sobre as trapaças de Eros. Então, a gente está lendo esse livro, vai ser bastante interessante. E o seu livro também, né? o famoso Blue Fire, que é uma coletânea de textos do James Hillman. Thomas, é um prazer enorme te receber, particularmente a mim, que sou um leitor seu de muitos e muitos anos. Uma grande alegria ter você conosco. Sinta-se à vontade. Como a gente diz no Brasil, a casa é sua. Por favor, é um prazer ter você. Microfone fechado. All right. So what, what I'm Thank you, Marcus, for your, your wonderful words of welcome. And uh, I, I just wish I were there eating and drinking with you, but Zoom will do. Zoom is better than nothing. Uh, so I have, you know, I don't know if I've spoken to to Brazil before. I, I, I have had interactions with uh, Jungians in Brazil many times, but I think it was them visiting the United States when I met and uh, talked to people from, from various parts of Brazil. Uh, I wish I could have gone. I was invited, but uh, sometimes it's difficult to travel. So, um, Uh, let, uh, let me, uh, I have to orient myself because uh, I last week spoke to Jungians in Romania and, but actually there were not many Jungians, there were mainly just people doing therapy. And I understand that your uh, community here is quite well uh, educated in Jung and, uh, and even in Hillman. 
So I have to orient myself to thinking of talking to you who know, who already have some background. But um, there are things that I would like to, to bring to your attention. But before I do, I'd like to add a little bit to your introduction, just to say a word about myself. Uh, when I was in my teens and 20s, I was a Catholic monk. And although I, am, I, I try to live like a monk today in my own way, in a very ordinary way, um, and I left that life behind me, it does affect me. And so in my writing, uh, even today in all my books, I feel like I write like a monk and a therapist. I don't write as an intellectual. I'm really not, that's not who I am. I'm not someone who develops theories and, and prefers that. Hillman was more that kind of person. But I, I write like a, I think like a therapist. And when I actually sit down to write, I feel like I'm a monk again. I, I surrounded by my books usually and wanting to write in a way that people can understand and where it might affect uh, the difficulties that they run into in ordinary life. So I see myself as a therapeutic writer and that has some relevance to what I want to say today, that um, I want to reimagine, reconsider the word therapy and therapist. It's difficult because, especially for their, well, both sides, therapists are, they have some complexes around being the therapist. They, uh, I think, I can say that including myself, um, that they are very, um, I think that they hold their, their professionalism very tightly many times. Not everybody, obviously, but many times. And after publishing my book, Soul Therapy, I heard from therapists who didn't like me referring to ordinary people as therapists at times in their own lives. They didn't think that was proper to do that. But I do, and I don't hesitate in that. I think that uh, uh, everybody has a therapist in them, you might say. And that at times in our lives, we're called to be therapists. The way I see it is that there are certain things human beings can do for each other. It's very interesting that we have powers with each other. Like one human being can help another person when they're physically ill, like a doctor or a nurse can help a person when they're physically ill. That's a wonderful thing. We don't, I don't think we reflect on it much to see that this is one human being being able to help another person survive and, and thrive and live well. That's, that's an amazing thing. And the role of doctor is, is very profound. And I don't think we understand at all today what that means. I may be speaking here more of my own culture, but you can adjust to your culture. But in my culture, it seems that doctors are te technicians. They primarily, they know they study medications and chemicals, anatomy, things like that. But they don't seem to study the mystery of illness. You know, the mystery of what it means to get sick. And therefore they don't explore ways to help a person who is sick that is, uh, speaks more to their, to their inner life or their life of emotion and meaning. So, uh, but it's still interesting and fascinating that human beings can help each other this way. That's how I see therapy. It's a power, a potency that we have, a power. So that if, let's say, your brother calls you and says, I'm, I'm having trouble in my marriage, would you, mind, would you mind coming and talking to me? Let's have lunch and talk for a while. 
that's a remarkable moment when the brother can go and have lunch with his brother and through words and through presence can actually help help the other person get along, maybe lift some depression, maybe uh, clarify some confusion. These are remarkable things that we can do for each other. They are powers. It's a power of therapy. It's one of the great powers of life, therapy. And to be therapeutic is, is a great, uh, it's of great importance, both for the person who has helped or cared for and for the person who is caring because even the therapist gains a great deal from being a therapist. I think that's worth thinking about too. I'd like you to, to consider that question. What are some of the things that benefit you in being a therapist? This is an aspect of the so-called wounded healer that I don't hear talked about very much. That uh, we say in archetypal psychology, don't split the archetype of therapist and client. Don't split that, that deep relationship. Understand that the client has some powers of healing and understand that the therapist has many things in his own life or her own life that he has to deal with. But there's another side to it, and that is that both people in therapy benefit. I always feel that when I practice therapy, I'm in therapy. And when I'm in therapy, of course, I'm practicing therapy. I'm doing something for the therapist as well. So let's, let's look at this word therapy more closely then. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very ancient Greek word, therapeia. I mean, it's almost the same word, therapeia. Ancient Greek word, therapeia. Plato uses the word quite often. That's pretty interesting to me. They go all the way back. This is fourth century BC before Christ. Uh, Plato was writing about therapy. For, the, for those of you who would like to pursue it, I'm thinking now of a dialogue of Plato called Euthyphro. Let me spell that because it's a strange word. It's a name, E-U-T-H-Y. P-H-R-O, E-U-T-H-Y-P-H-R-O. Euthyphro, in this dialogue, Socrates is in court because he's been accused of uh, misleading the youth and not uh, sacrificing to the gods. And he's at the courthouse and he meets a man there who was uh, involved because he was in the courthouse because he, he, as I recall, he killed his father. So they have a conversation. And the conversation is very interesting, very, very interesting. It's about therapy and about uh, which the word is therapeia and ho holiness. I can't think of a good word, a better word for that. Um, it would be like someone who goes to the temple of the gods. That whatever character that is, if it's holiness or piety, something like that. That's the other word that they're, they're talking about, hosian, um, religiousness, spirituality, something like that. So the student says to Socrates, all right, he says, you've been using the word therapy. Tell me what that means. And when I first read that, I, 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 I just, like my, all my senses brightened up everything. I wanted to hear the answer to that question because I wanted to know the answer to that for a long time. What is therapy? And I'd love to know what Plato's Socrates thought about that. 
So Socrates says, well, he says, therapy is care. Care is the word used, care. He said it's like a farmer taking care of horse, the horse or a hunter taking care of his dogs. The daily care of the uh, other in your world is what therapy is. So they go on in their conversation and the, the question comes up, what about therapy of the gods? The Greek phrase there is therapia theon. I say that because it's a very nice phrase to keep in mind if, you, if you're all interested like I am in the original language for these things. Therapia theon means the therapy of the gods. So Socrates says, no, you don't mean when we talk about therapy of the gods, that the gods need therapy, that we can help them. They don't need our help. So what is it? And they decide that therapy of the gods is to do anything that is pleasing to the gods. To do whatever is pleasing to the gods is therapy. Now, if you think of that, you know, you don't want to be too literal or, you know, too, uh, I don't know what the word is, too literal about that. When I hear that, I think of uh, Greek dramas and I think of the work of James Hillman. The Greek dramas and Hillman both ask the question, when something has gone, gone wrong with a person, they say, what God have you offended? Or what Hillman says, put, you know, find out which altar to go to when you have trouble in your life. Which altar is it? Which God or goddess? So if we think of it that way, the gods as, as, as described in the work of Jung and Hillman and even Freud a little bit, like the Oedipus, things like that. Medusa, Freud wrote about Medusa. Beautiful essay, little essay on Medusa. So uh, when we think of the gods, let's think of Freud and Jung and Hillman talking about the gods as, as the great themes, the great powers in life. Like, for example, if we're talking about the goddess Aphrodite or uh, Venus, we think of the power in our lives of sexuality, of uh, sensual pleasure, of being intimate with another person. Or if we think of, let's say, the god Mars or Ares, we're thinking of the great power in life of our anger, it's difficult, Some, a lot of people have trouble with anger, but it's a great power to be angry enough to be inspired to do something important in life. I felt, to make a personal comment, I, I think Hillman would agree. I felt that James Hillman wrote and talked from his anger most of the time. He was angry about, angry about society that wasn't doing what it could for people. He was very angry about bad treatment of animals. That was one of his big themes. I saw him lecture once angrily about the treatment of animals. And when he talked, he, he quoted, he read from a book by Hemingway describing an elephant being slaughtered. And while Hel Hillman was speaking, he, he, he couldn't continue. He had tears in his eyes and he couldn't continue. And he was so angry about the bad treatment of animals. So our, the gods then are so important. They're the great powers. They're not, they're not parts of us. These gods and goddesses, sometimes people write books saying that the 
gods and goddesses are aspects of ourselves or parts of ourselves. That, that is, how can you possibly say that when you read the great literature of the gods and when you uh, visit a temple, how can you say that these are aspects of ourselves? That's, it is, it is a terrible, terrible reducing of what the gods are. We have somehow, and Hillman works this out at the very end of revisioning psychology in talking about psychology and religion. He says there is in fact a kind of religion going on in our relationship to the gods and goddesses. It's not, we're not psychologizing them. We're not making them into psychological categories. We're not reducing them to aspects of human beings. I would suggest to you, if you pick up, there are many books that say this. If you pick up a book like that, I would, you know, use it to prop up a table or something. Don't read it. It's such a terrible sacrilege, I think, to psychologize the gods. And therefore, the demand on us as therapists is to do what Socrates was talking about. He said, do what is pleasing to the gods. Do what the gods ask of us. So how many people do you know who are having great trouble in life because they simply can't bring themselves to do what Aphrodite, Venus, asks of them? Because it's so difficult given our background, family background and religious background, it's so difficult. But imagine the liberation that could come from doing what is pleasing to Venus. So we're talking about, you see what I said about writing as a monk. I'm still close to religion. Uh, when I, when I, I went to a university, Syracuse University, which is a very fine university here in the States. And uh, my, in my first seminar, I was, told to, I was told to read the collected works of Jung for that seminar, the collected works of Jung, not a book or two. And so I read as fast as I could and I read the collected works of Jung in that course taking other courses at the same time. And before I left Syracuse, I read the collective works again, all of them closely. And I would recommend to anyone of you, here I feel like the old man, the mentor, the old man, the Saint X speaking. I'm telling you that if you want to, if you want to be good, at your Jungian approach to your therapy work. Please read all of Jung, every word. Don't just read a little bit and say, oh, I know Jung. Read it all. Do, do you know, take the challenge. Don't be, don't be uh, hesitant about it. Don't go halfway. And I would say the same thing if you're going, if you really want to know Jung, you must read everything by James Selma, everything. Not just a book or two, everything. It is worth, your life is worth it. I mean, what I'm saying is that if, for you to read all of Jung and Hillman will transform your life. It'll transform, you don't have to agree with it all. I don't, I don't agree with all of Hillman or all of Jung. Hillman and I used to have lots of arguments about things. We didn't agree on many things, but we were very close. And so, uh, but that's my suggestion to you. I just, I don't know, it's, you've got to take yourself seriously. I see many students who are toying with Jung, and I'm so discouraged by it because they're not doing anything for themselves. They're not doing anything.
for themselves. You should be as, I think, as dedicated as you, if you want to call yourself a Jungian, be as dedicated and as work as hard as Jung did. If you want to be an archetypal psychologist, work as hard as James Hillman did and face criticism constantly uh, for being who he was and what he wrote. I know I was close to him all those years. I saw it, the amount of criticism and uh, judgment and uh, disregard that he got was amazing. I don't know how he stood it. I don't know how he, he continued his positive outlook on life, which he had. And Jung, of course, too, had many, many problems of that kind. So if you want to become a Jungian, or if you want to be an archetypal psychologist, be ready for criticism and stand up to it. Go ahead and do your work, but know it, know it well. Okay, I didn't mean to preach, but it comes, it comes on you, you know, just an angel passes and you do it. Okay, so um, now one more thing about this word therapeia. I think it's, it's one of these great words. There are certain words in various cultures that are holy words. They're really special words. They have tremendous power, great power. Words like Tao in China. Tao, such a powerful word. If you read the Tao Te Ching, and I'm telling you again, <laughs> you must read it. I read it all my life. I don't know how many times each year I read the Tao Te Ching. It keeps me on the non-heroic path. It's a very, very important text. But the Tao then becomes a, a very sacred word. Or if you go to India and you hear about Dharma, Dharma is not just, dharma, well, Dharma could be the way the world is, that it's a meaningful world that we live in. It could be that we have the Dharma, that we have a Dharma in us, that we have our own rule of life. And the Dharma might be a community, but it's a, but it's a holy word. It's a power word. And Logos is similar in some traditions. Logos is one of those power words. Uh, and the Gospel of John begins uh, to begin, uh, how would I say, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Powerful, powerful word, Logos. Related to myth, the Greeks use the plural of that word to refer to their mythologies. Logos. I'm getting a little far from the central theme here. I better get back. Um, so that's a power word. I think therapeia is one of the similar words. It's a powerful word, like logos, dharma, tao. It's a very powerful word. I'll tell you something you may know um, that adds to this theme. A very interesting thing happened in Egypt uh, about the time of Christ. Uh, right outside Alexandra, Alexandria, there's a lake. It's actually, it looks like it's part of Alexandria, but it's that close, but it's right there at Alexandria, Mariotis. And there was a community that lived on the shores of this lake. Some scholars today and historians think that it was a community of Buddhists. And some think that Jesus studied there. That's not a wild thought. It's been explored by serious scholars to consider. Perhaps Jesus studied there because there are many indications 
when he was in Egypt, that he really did something significant. And one possibility is that he studied with the Buddhists in Alexandria. Now, they referred to their people there as therapeutes. The monks were called therapeutes, using our same word, ther therapy, therapeutes. So there's again that connection to the contemplative religious person with, ther with therapist. There's in the background, in other words, the historical background of, the, of therapy is this instance where the, ther the therapists were monks. And uh, they called the, the women who were monks therapeutes, using our word, therapy, therapist. I keep that in mind when I'm thinking of therapy, that uh, there's a steep, interesting tradition, history of that word for what we do. So it's not simple what a therapist is. It's not simple at all to ask what a therapist is and what a therapist does. But I can tell you, I hope that I'm giving you an impression that it's a very profound thing to do. Very, very profound. It's not learning how to help people manage their lives. That is so superficial, to, you know, uh, the def definition of therapy. That's not what it is. It's a monk's contemplative exploration of a person's deepest soul. Now, who can do that? Who can help another person go deep into their soul, the deepest source of their meaning? Not just make their lives turn out well. A lot of people who are very soulful don't turn out well at all. In fact, I almost think that most people who are very soulful don't actually get it right in life. Some of the most soulful people I know are uh, psychotic. So we have that problem. Look at uh, one of the most soulful poets, and you would probably, I don't know if you would know of her. In America, one of the great soulful poets of America is Anne Sexton, who was in therapy almost all her life and in hospitals and finally committed suicide. Tremendously soulful poet and person, as far as I can make out. So our job is not to make life easier or better. It's not to make people, not to improve people's character or lives. It's not about improvement. It's not about doing better. This is what all the spiritual traditions teach. It's not about doing better. Now, but the question is then, how can a person be trained to be this kind of a, of a therapist? How do you train someone to be a therapist like this? I'm going to suggest again, read the last three pages of Revisioning Psychology of Hilma where he talks about religion and psychology and think in terms of therapists then, what kind of a therapist would be able to uh, live and, and work according to those principles at the end of his book, where we honor the gods and goddesses. We do what is pleasing to them. How do you do that? How do you prepare to help people do this? I think it takes a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, unusual preparation. It's not the usual thing where you go to a training program and learn what to do and then practice it and have a supervisor look over and see what you're doing. And that's it's not quite doesn't quite fit well into that that role. I would say that. In your own way, 
you have to develop within yourself such uh, liberation where you can be with a person and they, they, they pick up from you how to really live their lives and not somebody else's. How to really live their lives. And they have to get that from you somehow. One of the great Buddhist teachings is, for doctors is, heal by your presence. Heal by your presence. So we have two things, I think, going for us as therapists, words and presence. You put those two together, and I think then we can be with a person therapeutically. Notice I'm not saying, how do you, how do you solve a person's problem? You don't have to reduce a person to a problem. But how are you with a person who is like any human being dealing with the great mysteries of life and, and coming eventually learning that they've probably given up on themselves too much. They haven't trusted themselves to be, to be a unique person. And how do you, how can you be with them in a way that they can discover this? Words are what we have, partly. Words are very important. And another important thing is, and we've learned this from other uh, spiritual traditions as well, that um, we, we need to have what Hillman called a poetic basis of mind, a poetic way of seeing, seeing, not a literal factual way, but a poetic way of seeing. One that goes deep and doesn't explain things, but rather evokes the mysteries involved going on through a poetic way of thinking and talking. So one way to see that, I think it's pretty obvious, but I think it's worth thinking about, is that uh, one of the things we, we, we can use in therapy, which we do use, is narrative stories. But by that, I don't mean that we should be good at explaining a story. So if someone tells you the story of childhood, of their childhood, you might be tempted to take a, you know, explain it, to explain the rest of their life by what happened in their childhood. You're missing the narrative. It's the narrative that counts. Or as Hillman said over and over again, stick to the image, stay close to the images. Stay close to the stories. So another way to put it is that one of the ways in which we begin to make soul out of isolated events of childhood or some other of life in general is the first step might be to turn them into narrative. And if you were aware of that as a therapist, and were really knowledgeable, have thought about story and narrative, you can work effectively with the stories because that might be your skill. That's a skill of the soul. Narrative is a soul activity. Explanation is a mental activity. And yet so many psychologists are taught to explain. And they consider they're actually being effective when they explain something. Explain why a person is feeling the way they do or acting the way they are. This other way, this archetypal way, and Hillman always said that archetypal is an adjective. He was not interested in a psychology of archetypes. He said he had to study archetypes in Zurich over and over again. He said he was finished with that. He wanted to do an archetypal psychology, archetypal adjective. So you, you stay with the narratives. You don't explain. 
and you stay at that at that deep level and that's where the soul is uh there was a there's a path there's a there's a piece of writing of jung that i feel is very very important it, it's called the uh, the child archetype you can find it in his uh, the volume of his collective works called the archetypes of the collective unconscious or you can find it in a book put together with his essay on the child archetype and carl kermeny's essay on the child what does he call it the child the divine child i think he calls it the divine child both very very interesting essays and there's a part in the if you read Jung's essay on the child, what is so interesting about it is that he is not interested in children in that essay. Maybe in passing a little bit, but not essentially. It's not children that he was interested in, and he's not interested in childhood. That's difficult for a psychologist, I think. We're, we're supposed to be interested in childhood. Jung is not interested in childhood in that essay. He's interested in the child that, that is the child we are today and always. The child that is always with us, always, and, and living through us. That's the child. He makes it so clear. So that's what archetypal means more. It means being in touch with the imaginal figures, not literal figures, but imaginal figures, even if they are in the guise of and look like real persons and maybe ourselves as children. Jung in that essay would say uh, that our when we talk about our childhood, we're talking about the child, the archetypal child. That really changes things, it seems to me, in our work. So we're working with people and listening to their narratives. We might be tempted to translate them into personal history rather than to explore the soul. After all, our work is called psychotherapy. I think even in your language, it's the same, isn't it? I was looking up those words today in Portuguese. Uh, the word for psyche and for uh, therapy, very, very close. Psychotherapy then means, means to care for the soul. Remember Plato? And Socrates, therapy means to care for just the same as a farmer might care for a horse or a hunter might care for a dog. What we do is care for the soul. That's our job. Just like the farmer's job is to take care for the care, you know, and know how to take care of a horse and do it with love. And a hunter takes care of his dogs with love and with intelligence. We take care of our soul because we are human beings. Farmer is to horse as hunter is to dog, as human is to soul. We take care of our souls and we take care of the souls of people who ask us to care for them. It might be that we are professionals, which is a wonderful, excellent, I could, the most excellent of all professions to be a therapist, I think. Um, but we might, it might be our brother who calls us up and says, I need to talk to you. We're caring for the soul. Uh, in the little, a little bit more, I, I don't want to say too much more. I know this is already a lot to, to give you, but one last thing I don't want to overlook. 
is that uh, there's so many other issues to talk about. Maybe they'll come up in our conversation. But one thing is that we got this from uh, Robert Sardello and others and uh, Hillman later in his career, that we, our job also is to care for our world, for the soul of the world, the soul of the world, the planet on which we live has a soul is a living being. The Renaissance uh, writers that I studied in my doctoral work said that the earth is an animal, is an animal. It's not an object, it's an animal. Like an animal, it has a life. We don't understand that kind of life because like we don't understand much about other animal life either, it's quite different. But we need, that's, that's one place in which we can find the world soul, the planet in which we live. We don't live on it. The planet that is our matrix, the source of our life. Another thing is, and this was developed primarily by uh, Robert Sardello, but uh, Hillman also worked on it, the soul of things. The soul of things. Understanding that human beings are not the only things, are not the only sources of soul. Things have soul as well. Even things that are made by human beings have soul. We, have, we can relate to them. We can love them. They can depend on us. We can depend on them. We can almost be married to some things. You know, we are so close and so attached. And those are signs of soul. So I think it's quite clear that today in our time, we need to see soul everywhere and in things as well and in the world. Uh, you may not know that uh, Hillman made several videos about things. He made very interesting videos about architecture. And for example, he has a video on ceilings, what ceilings are, and what the ceiling, what the soul of a ceiling would be, or the soul of an automobile. He gave a, he wrote, a, he made a video on that theme. Robert Sardello and I, he, he's an archetypal psych, he was an archetypal psychologist. He still is to some extent, but his interests have gone in many directions. But um, he and I years ago used to go together to computer conferences and talk about the soul of a computer. recognizing that things are not lifeless. They're not inanimate. They're not beyond relationship. Uh, and so we can have this kind of close connection with the things around us. And the, what that does, it gives us a soulful world in which to live. It can be very difficult to try to be a person caring for your own soul in a world that doesn't, or in a world that has been made inanimate. It may sound a little crazy, but when you think about that, you might, you might begin to appreciate what many of the surrealistic painters and playwrights were doing. Uh, there's an example that comes to my mind. I don't know why it just popped into my mind. There was a, there was a very celebrated absurdist uh, playwright called Alfred Jerry, Jerry. And he used to go around with a lobster on a leash. He would walk around to visit his friends and he would have a lobster on a leash, just like you'd have a dog on a leash. He had a lobster on a leash. And I think the surrealists understood that, that things that we don't think of having soul do. And when you, when, you, when you do live that way, 
it might look strange to other people. You may look odd to other people. So I have always felt as a therapist that one of the goals in therapy is to for a person to find his or her own eccentricity. How to be eccentric. Eccentric means outside the circle. So how to be yourself, not just caught up in, the, in, in that circle that ties you up. So uh, there's one more thing to pick up one new, new topic. It's one that I, I just, I went by before, but we have a few more minutes, a couple more minutes. So I want to say this, that one of the most important things I learned from archetypal psychology was, as a therapist was, to stay close to the symptom, whatever symptom a person is presenting, stay close to it appreciate it. Don't try to get rid of it. Don't even have it in your mind to, to get rid of the symptom. In a way, you have to love the symptom in order to do the work. And I know that's difficult. I'll give you an example. I once had a woman come to me in therapy many, many years ago who was uh, having trouble with alcohol. Uh, she was an alcoholic and really wanting to get, wanting to deal with it, but she came to me with a symptom of alcohol. And in the first, the first dream she presented to me, I, I just remember now we haven't talked about dreams. I don't know how we lost that. Um, but the first dream she presented to me was she was in a church and while she stood there in a the church, an angel came down from high and placed a martini on the altar. I always felt that was very instructive, not only for that woman, but for my whole career, to always be ready for the angel that brings the martini to the person who's alcoholic. You know, it's like, you need the symptom, you need that. She needs the alcohol, but only because it represents or embodies for her the angelic alcohol, the heavenly martini, the, the alchemical substance instead of the literal substance. That was a very alchemical looking dream, but also very spiritual. So I think we could have that same attitude toward all symptoms that we deal with. Understand that when a person's symptom is that they are depressed, there's some kind of heavenly depression that is just waiting to enter that life and make it wonderful. But we have to be able to get to the point to see to see what the dream has seen, that the alcohol is only there because the person has not yet found the angel's alcohol. The symptom is there hiding. I mean, the, the, the solution to the person's existence is hiding in the symptom. It's uh, covered over by the symptom. At least that's, that's how I see it anyway. Uh, so this all makes the practice of therapy quite, quite mysterious and subtle. I think anyone, anyone can do it to an extent, but those of us who are professionals really train ourselves in these many things to be able to see more deeply into what's happening. And there's great, great pleasure in doing that. And if you can do this work of therapy from a deep place, and have the confidence of having thought things through and dealt with your own life in that soul sort of way, I think that we will have great satisfaction in doing the work. And we won't feel too bad when someone like me comes along and says, well, you know, even ordinary people can do this for each other. 
maybe not at that level of skill and that for very specific and difficult problems, but the therapist is there in everybody. And all they have to do is tap into it. That's a long time. I've talked to you for an hour. That's, whew, you deserve something for this. Uh, so I'm gonna let uh, somebody else now lead us. Marcus. Obrigado, Thomas. É uma hora de várias inquietações, de várias questões interessantes para a gente poder conversar. Pessoal, seguindo é, o protocolo do Tiaços, quem quiser fazer pergunta, coloca o nome no chat e aí eu chamo e a pessoa realiza a pergunta, tá? É... Thomas, queria começar com uma questão, duas questões. É... Para você, é importante é, delimitar a fronteira entre o monge e o terapeuta? Essa, essa é uma divisão importante para você fazer, que você faz, ou isso se tornou, ao longo do tempo, irrelevante? Essa é a primeira pergunta, depois eu faço a outra. Thank you, thank you. Very, very interesting question. Uh, uh, I guess what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm trying to loosen the idea of what a monk is and what a therapist is. And when you, when you do that, make them more imaginal than literal, then then the monk and the therapist come closer. You can, I wouldn't expect most therapists to think they're monks, but I, have, I was a monk for 13 years in my life. So that, that is part of my material, it's part of who I am. And so it makes sense to me, I think, to bring that into it. Now somebody else, it might be something very different. I know therapists who have been, uh, business leaders. Well, maybe they want to bring that in, and not quite in a literal way, but that vision of life that they can bring to being a therapist with that, with that in them, that character. So it works for me. I, I, I don't need any barrier between them. Uh, I think the presence of the monk helps me be a therapist. Um, I was obviously drawn to that historical point about the uh, people in Alexandria being uh, Buddhists, very contemplative. Had, they made a total contemplative life and, uh, and called themselves therapists. Uh, when you think of therapy meaning care and psyche meaning soul, it seems to me that not too unusual to have a monk or even a priest or minister be the, that figure be around, be, be incorporated somehow. Eu queria te fazer uma outra questão para a gente continuar. É... Sobre o cuide de sua alma. Queria que você falasse um pouco da importância desse teu livro na tua vasta obra é, e por que, que ele ainda é um livro que, é, que se tornou uma referência para tantos e muitos. É, queria te contar uma história pessoal. Eu tenho vários amigos que leram esse livro e que não são terapeutas. Absolutamente. Chegaram no livro por caminhos outros. E talvez essa seja a grande riqueza desse livro. Mas queria que você contasse para a gente um pouco a tua experiência com o livro e com a repercussão dele. Uh, I understand your question, I think. Uh, I don't understand, intellectually, I don't understand 
why people would be drawn to this book. To me, it's not the most interesting one of the ones I've written. Uh, I don't think it's as, as well written as other books of mine. On the other hand, I, when I, if I ever do read into, I, I've never reread it, but if I ever read into it once in a while, I, I do feel that it's, it's, you know, it's not bad. Um, but I would say that uh, uh, there's some magic in creativity, you know, in making something. There's magic. This, that, this is my, one of my fields. I wrote my dissertation on magic. I take magic very seriously. As, as a way of being in the world and of doing things, to do them with magic rather than uh, skill. And um, so there's something magical about this book. I don't know exactly what it is. One, sometimes I used to think, well, maybe it's just the title. Maybe, maybe people just buy it for the title, but you know, because this is an ancient phrase, care of the soul is in Plato. Not my phrase, it's in Plato. So um, it has a long history and maybe that indicates that potency. Um, I think, sometimes I think that people understand that they have never thought about caring for their soul before. They've never taken the word soul seriously. Many people have not read the book because they think it's religious in some way that would offend them. Um, but, you know, ultimately then I, I can't answer the question. I don't know. Uh, I, I do know that um, the book is still selling. People still buy the book. <laughs> 20, what, 30, almost 30 years. No, it is 30 years this year since it was published. 1992, I think. So, uh, it's an object, you know? Uh, that's an interesting thing. You make something and you can't be too identified with it. I've written other books that I wish people would read <laughs> and they don't. They read this one. And I really don't know why. I think it's magic. And if it is magic, then I can't take, I can't be too identified with it. I just let it be. When people tell me about it, I'm very happy in a way, but I'm not happy in a, I don't feel that there's any narcissism in that book anymore for me. And it may have been years ago, it was important to me to get into the writing world. Um, but uh, at this point, it exists on its own. It has its own reality. And I don't have much to do with it. I, I don't promote it. I don't, I don't recommend that people read it. I, I haven't done that in many, many years. So it just has its own life. É mágica, é uma boa resposta. <laughs> Obrigado. Patrícia, Patrícia Eugênio, por favor. Olá, boa tarde. Thomas, obrigada Olá. por compartilhar da sua experiência, do seu conhecimento aqui com a gente. Você falou uh, da palavra psicoterapia e terapia eh, de uma forma bastante consistente. E eu queria saber se, na sua opinião, o fato dos psicanalistas usarem o termo análise e alguns Jungianos também usarem o termo análise, faz eh, com que a conduta do terapeuta seja diferente a partir do uso dessa expressão. O, o analista que faz análise é diferente do psicoterapeuta que faz terapia. É, é, há uma diferença na perspectiva teórica, na conduta, no manejo terapeuta ou do analista? That's a wonderful question, thank you. Um, difficult to answer though, because 
I prefer the word therapist. I never, I never say that what I do is analysis. The word analysis though is interesting. It means to loosen up. Ana means up and lisa, lisas means uh, loosen. So there's a kind of liberation. Psychoanalysis could, could be interpreted, may be defined as the liberation of the psyche, liberation of the soul. That's not too bad, you know, as a, as a word for what we do. But the, that's the original meanings, but the contemporary meaning is more of analysis is, is more intellectual, a mental activity. And if that's what we are thinking when we do psychoanalysis, I think that would be a problem. I, in other words, I'd, I'd suggest keep using the word therapy. Muito obrigada. Obrigado, Patrícia. Mariana, você escreveu aqui, você não quer fazer a pergunta? Mariana? Uh, bom, vou ler. Uh, Isa, vou ler, tá? Há um livro extraordinário seu chamado Right in the Sand. O que lhe moveu a escrevê-lo? Por favor, fale um pouco da comunidade Sevita. Okay. Uh, my, uh, thank you for that question. Um, the book, Writing in the Sand, uh, was my attempt to look at the life of Jesus in a way similar to the way I do my work with Greek gods and goddesses. I've, I've written a lot about the, the gods and the, the, from Greece. And one time I was giving a, a talk and someone afterwards asked me if I would write about Jesus. Why don't I write about Jesus? Uh, and, you know, and I, 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 I went home and I thought, well, that's a good question. Why don't I write about Jesus? It's a good deep question, you know, It'd probably take a lot of therapeutic time for me to really answer it. But, um, I thought to myself, I should write about Jesus and I'm very interested. And I have a different uh, take and I, I, uh, I, um, I wrote this book. Prim much of it is uh, uh, like looking at some terms, some words that I feel had been mistranslated. And if they were translated more classically, the way the classical literature dealt with them, they would make more sense and they would be free of the uh, terrible moralism and dogmatism that came into that religion. That was one of the greatest tragedies of human history, that the moralists and dogmatists got a hold of that wonderful collection of stories in the gospels. So I was trying to liberate the gospels from that, that tradition. I'll give you an example. The word, uh, one word often translated in English, uh, of course, and for me, sin, I don't, you have your own word for that. I don't know if it has the same connotations, but the word sin usually is the translation for hamartia. And yet Aristotle wrote a rather long essay. I mean, this is Aristotle, kind of a very dispassionate uh, philosopher wrote a long essay on the word hamartia in relation to uh, Greek tragedy. And he says that hamartia is the fatal mistake or the great mistake a person makes due to his ignorance about how life works and what's going on. It's a mistake do a, a really, I mean, a big tragic mistake that the, the stuff of the great Greek tragedies, 
why a person's life is ruined because of ignorance. Now, if that's what Aristotle sees as hamartia, to me, it's a, it's a mistake to translate that as sin, which is such a, like a personal thing, like a personal, not a mistake, but something in you that you've done something wrong and you should be sorry for it and you will be punished for it. That is not in Aristotle's interpretation of hamartia. And I would think he's closer to the word than the people who translated that as sin, probably in the 15th century or something, you know, like a thousand years later or so. Um, so I, I felt that it was a good idea to take words like that and see that if there was more depth and more subtlety in them. And so in that book, Writing in the Sand, one of the things I do is look at several words that are like that. And then what I did after I published uh, Writing in the Sand, I translated the four canonical gospels from Greek into English in four volumes. I translated four volumes with notes. So I really read closely, read those gospel stories in Greek very closely. And I found so many, many places, maybe most of, the, most of it, that could be made so much more human and more, and give more depth uh, by, just by the translation. And not, a, not a, what you want, I did, not words I'd like to have there, but words that I were in the tradition that, and made sense and was accurate to use those translations like that one. Another example I'll give you is, uh, you might be interested in this one. Uh, the Greek, uh, in Greek, the, the, the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father, which is in the gospel, is pater himon, pater himon, like father, our father, pater himon, hoen tois or anois, uh, our father in the sky. The word there is uranos, and it means sky in Greek, sky. One of the uh, Greek gods was called Uranus. We call it in English Uranus today, planet Uranus. But it's the sky. So in my translation, it's our father who is in the sky. Our father in the sky. Because it's an image. It's a poetic image, the sky. Not heaven as afterlife or some other world. But the sky, which many, many religions use as a reference to that which is transcendent and big and beyond us that we want to relate to. So that's what I, I did in those two books. Actually, it's those five books, the four, the four gospel translations and writing in the sand. I tried to, uh, I actually, I was hoping that people might appreciate Jesus more that way than less that and that they would appreciate that but you know very few people have read those books very very few i don't know 500 people have read those and my books usually sell in you know hundreds of thousands and this was you know 500 maybe possibly so uh, i don't have much hope that way but uh it's there and i'm happy that they're there uh, the last part of your question was a little more about the uh, the monks in Mariotis in uh, Alexandria. I don't I don't know a whole lot about it. I've read the historians who are writing about it these days. Uh, they there are things that they explore. Things like there was this town right next to Alexandria on the other side of Alexandria from this lake, where ships. Uh, we're, we're, we're docking regularly from, from all over the place, like from India and from China. We're uh, docking there. So the fact that Buddhists might have a, uh, a, a community there is not so unusual. Buddhists were known to be in that part of the world at that time. And there are records of Buddhist leaders bringing people, bringing, bringing Buddhist monks to that area. So it's not too unusual. And there is a tradition of them being Buddhist. 
So, uh, I mean, I don't know all the arguments. You can find them, they're out there. You could look online and, and you can find uh, the scholars who think that there's something to it. Um, I found it a fascinating story. And uh, I don't know if it's true, factual, I really don't. But uh, I'm inclined to, I'm inclined toward thinking that way because um, we have not yet understood Jesus and an Egyptian, as an Egyptian. We haven't understood that very well. Uh, there's a scholar whom I knew slightly, who was very, very good at writing about this history at the time. And he said that, and he wrote in his book that Jesus participated in some of the initiation rites in Egypt and uh, was, may have been tattooed as part of his rites. Jesus may have had tattoos. Now, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that the scholars are trying to understand more about Jesus as an Egyptian. His relationship to the god Osiris, which uh, has some parallels. So it's all very interesting, very similar to people who uh, find uh, Jesus as being Dionysian or having a Hermes quality to him, or uh, you know similar kinds of things. Sorry, I can't give you more than that. Obrigado, Mariana. É, Denise. Ah, Marco, desculpe. É que eu não tinha visto que minha filha tinha trocado o nome. É o Sérgio. Ah. Não é a Mariana com a voz grossa, não. É o Sérgio. <laughs> Muito obrigado. obrigado. Eu quero agradecer muito ao professor Thomas Moore. Muito obrigado. Grande abraço, Sérgio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Denise, está por aí? Uh, bom, a Denise deixou uma pergunta aqui. Uh, você poderia falar sobre o corpo do terapeuta e a experiência da presença? Well, first of all, um... Let me quote a couple of things to you. Uh, William Blake was a wonderful English poet who said, 18th century, who said that uh, the body is the soul perceived by our senses in our time. The body is the soul. I, I think that's an important statement coming from someone who really understood soul very well. So I don't want to separate body from soul in anything I say here. They're, they're, they have to be um, uh, completely, uh, completely meshed, come together. They're not separate, they're completely together, body and soul. So the presence then is Physically expressed, yes. There's a Chinese statement that the body is the physical expression of the soul. That puts it very well, I think. So again, we don't separate soul and body. But the body of the, of the uh, therapist, the physical life of the therapist is very, very important, obviously. Very, very important. Uh, how you are, you know, how, I mean, how you express yourself, the expression on your face, the way your body uh, gestures and is present uh, is everything. And the slightest gesture can, can uh, have a, a very big effect on a client. So you have to be aware of yourself as a physical presence. Uh, you, you can maybe sometimes make a, an unconscious gesture and it can either ruin the therapy or suddenly make things work. 
I have a, this is a strange example, but I once talked to a therapist who told me that he was having difficulty getting anywhere, funny way to put it, uh, with his client until one day he was, he was rocking back and forth on his chair and he fell off the chair and was sprawled out on the floor. And after that, the therapy went quite well. And I think there's something about the physical, you know, like that's a physical expression, no words, just a physical thing. Uh, part of it being accidental, so-called, or the presence of Hermes in the room at that, on that day. But uh, at the same time, it was very physical. So the physical presence is extremely important and requires, uh, you know, some, I think kind of the awareness of a dancer rather than being self-conscious about how you are physically and how you gesture and express yourself, more like a dancer that the therapy is an art form. It's like, you know, some people dance, some people do therapy. It's very similar. You are present making movements and using words and they have an impact and they have a way of expressing and getting through past the surface deep into the person's heart and soul and it's more like the work of an artist or a dancer so you might think of your yourself that th that's a good title i think for a piece of writing the therapist as a dancer you know how does the therapist move and how does a therapist express himself or herself uh, physically in the therapeutic hour how do you do that and where do you sit and how do you dress and uh, what are your expressions like? And, uh, can you, have you looked at the unconsciousness in your expression, in your physical presence? Is a lot of it unconscious? Is some of it unconscious? Can you get in touch with some of that so you're more aware of what it is that you're expressing? Could you, um, could you explore the, your, your physical presence with your client? Is that possible? Especially if it's an issue, if it, if it seems to get in the way and whatever it is. Um, and of course, uh, there's a way in which, because it is like a dance, every gesture has more meaning than it normally would. I think you could say that of gestures and therapy, that they have special meaning, that there, it isn't, when you're in therapy, you are in a dance, it's a very special moment and uh, you don't, when you're on stage, you don't act the same way you do when you're just in your daily life. So when you're on stage, you have to be very uh, thoughtful about how you react. That's why it's difficult. Things like touch are difficult. Uh, they can be, they can be uh, innocent or they can be uh, expressive to such a degree that they need to be explored in the therapy. Whether it's the, the uh, client touching you or you touching the client, either way. Or um, maybe other ways like dress. How a person is dressed makes a big difference of what they're present, about, what, about their presence. And it's not only the therapist, but the client. That's a lot to say there, but I don't know what more to say. Obrigado, Denise. Luciana, contigo. Thomas, eh, quero te agradecer pela sua palestra, pela forma como você trouxe as, essa, as suas palavras, com, que, que me trouxe muita serenidade no seu jeito de falar e o seu jeito de expor. Eh, eu queria trazer um incômodo e uma pergunta. Eu vou começar com o incômodo, para depois eu terminar mais bonitinho com a pergunta. É, queria que você me ouvisse com muito afeto esse meu incômodo, porque eu acho que é, ele, ele surgiu a partir da pergunta que o Marcos fez, né, do monge e do terapeuta, é, e eu acho que a gente vai ouvindo as coisas que a gente ouve conforme a nossa história de vida, né? E, e eu fiquei pensando, quando você fala que um, que um terapeuta pode ser visto também, pode ser, pode ser um trabalho de, de padre até, 
né? Eu fiquei, eu fiquei o meu incômodo vem de é, na minha história de vida os padres são aqueles que pregam uma verdade. E o terapeuta jamais pode fazer isso, porque eu acho que ele tem que trabalhar com a verdade do paciente. Né? É esse meu incômodo. Eu não sei se você quer falar alguma coisa a respeito, eu já vou para a pergunta. Yes, I'll try. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I think I understand. Um, when I think of a monk, that was the primary word we were using. I think of a contemplative person. When I was a monk, it was more about living everyday life thoughtfully and uh, uh, with an eye toward uh, deep, you know, deep uh, meaning and not, to, not just letting things happen unconsciously. And it was a deep community life where there was a lot of uh, trust between the community members and uh, support, a lot of mutual support. So much so that it's, uh, it's hard to imagine. I wouldn't have thought that community support means so much if I didn't know it from that experience. Uh, the priest is a little different, although my, th see, I use words that so differently. When I, th the priest for me is the, is the one who uh, conducts ritual or, or leads a ritual is not the one who gives a talk telling people how they should live or something like that. Um, that is part of the moralism that has come through uh, into the churches. Some priests are very good at leading ritual and some are not. Some don't, don't have the same appreciation for ritual. See, ritual is an imaginal act very much like I was saying therapy can be da a dance. A ritual is like an art form where it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an imaginal space. It's a, it's a liminal space too, liminal, meaning not part of normal life, but uh, more in the realm of ima uh, the imaginal realm. And uh, so the priest then, in my, the way I'm thinking of the priest and the monk, it's very much in tune with the archetypal therapist not much in tune with the therapist who tells people how they should live. That's more like the priest who stands up and tells people how they should live. Um, but more like, uh, more like uh, being able to be thoughtful about what's going on and uh, create that. Now, that's funny you, wish that you use the word serenity because when I just made a couple of notes just before we started today, things I didn't want to forget to bring up. And, One of them was that two of the values for me as a therapist are serenity and neutrality. I think they're important. I, keep, I think of them very often that I want to be serene when I'm working with people and not susceptible to a lot of uh, emotion and uh, argument and uh, I don't know, a lot of, uh, another thing I was going to talk about if I didn't have time is transference a lot of transferential kind of things where you might get caught up in your client's uh, inner life uh, as a response to them, sort of a counter-transference. Um, that, I, want, I think that serenity is one way to help deal with that. And, and that's an achievement. You don't just live a serene life without working on it, without really developing it. And the other thing is uh, neutrality It's like not making judgments, not even thinking judgments. When someone tells you something, again, with transference, you might immediately leap to a judgment about what's happening. If you can keep your, your neutrality, you have a good, a good chance then of bringing the therapy forward uh, by not getting caught in the person's emotion or their own interpretation of events, which might be very emotional. Um, it's very easy to get caught that way. Jung wrote about this over and over again, the power of the unconscious to be contagious, to get the therapist in trouble. He never stopped talking about that. I've often wondered what kind of troubles he had to have to say that so many times. Um, so uh, the neutrality and the uh, serenity are good 
uh, are very good to help you to deal with those kinds of issues that come up. Um, I don't know if you want to follow up on that. It seems to me it's an important question to ask, but I, or you had another question, whatever you'd like to do. Obrigada, Thomas. Eu acho que é, ouvir de um outro lado me ajuda a ressignificar, talvez, essa história né? minha. A outra pergunta que eu tinha é, é aquela frase do Jung, né? os deuses viraram doenças, né? que está num dos volumes dele. Eu fiquei pensando, como é que a gente pode pensar essa frase a partir de como você começou a palestra, né? dizendo que... É, qual é o altar de qual Deus que a gente é, pode colocar o problema do paciente? Se os deuses viraram Sim. doenças, como é que a gente vai se aproximar é, desse altar? Yeah. Well, I think let's look at those uh, statements a little more closely. So Jung said that today the gods are, we don't worship the gods in temples the way people used to. So what do we do? Have the gods gone away? You know, this is the theme of theologians not long ago who talked about the death of God, which could be understood as the death of the gods and goddesses as well. Have they, have they gone away? Are we living in a secular world now where the gods are gone? They're not even a factor? Jung says that no, the gods are not gone. We encounter them. We encounter those ancient gods now in our troubles. I don't know if disease is the best word. I wonder what word he used in German. Um, so it's not, it's that the gods are, are, I think the gods are present in our disturbances or in our difficulties in life, the gods are present. So, um, as I said before, in the lives of many, many people, and this was explored uh, in very, very ingenious ways by psychoanalysts, um, that the goddess Venus, or Aphrodite, has been, has been, in, has been neglected and maybe abused mm -hmm. by so many people thinking that they are, they are above what she represents, that they, that they have been convinced by their religion or their parents or somebody that uh, their sexuality is, uh, is not something of great importance and that they don't have to pay attention to and do not have to even live, that it would be better if they were they didn't have a, they weren't sexual. Um, or that certain kinds of sexuality are not appropriate, they're not, not allowed for, for them. Um, so all of that, you can see the, the repercussions of this kind of sexual repression. We see it as therapists all the time. And we can see that we're doing what we're doing then is bringing that repression to the altar of Aphrodite or Venus. And then we, we explore Venus, not, not as psychological things, ideas, but, but as imaginal figures that are powers in life uh, that we have to either honor somehow or we will suffer the consequences. Hillman wrote a, a, a delivered a talk, in fact, one that he and I, we, he and I lectured together once in a church, in a, Episcopal Church, I think it was. And he gave a talk, I think he gave a talk called Aphrodite's Revenge. In other words, if you, if you don't, if you don't uh, go to the temple of Aphrodite, she will get her revenge. She will make life miserable for you. If you don't go to the altar of Hermes, and if you must be totally virtuous all your life, um, you're going to suffer that neglect of Hermes. Mm -hmm. So that's placing the problems we have on the altars of the gods. And uh, the diseases is really the difficulties we have, the symptoms we have. And uh, that's where the gods are there for us to discover once again. Mm -hmm. 
Obrigada. Obrigado, Lu. Thomas, temos, temos espaço para mais duas perguntas? Pode ser? I thought we were I thought we were going much longer, but whatever whatever you like. I thought we had two hours there. Whatever you like. Ah, então tá. Então tá bom. Então tá. Vamos, então vamos mais duas ou três perguntas, tá bom? Obrigado. Berenice, você é, quer fazer a sua pergunta? É. Oi, pessoal. Obrigada. Obrigada pela participação, por essa palestra emocionante que me tocou profundamente. Obrigada, Marcos, pela, pelo momento aqui de poder falar. A mim me tocou, de maneira geral, toda a, tua fala, a sua fala. Mas, em especial, eu fiquei com a questão da, do treinamento dos terapeutas. E aí, pegando essa visão arquetípica, eu fiquei me perguntando qual a relevância, ou qual a necessidade, ou qual a urgência que nós, como treinadores ou, ou facilitadores de um, um treinamento de um terapeuta, precisamos nos fazer quanto aos deuses. Como, por exemplo, a que Deus eu estou servindo quando eu estou me propondo a treinar um psicólogo, um terapeuta, a fazer a sua arte da terapia. A que templo eu estou servindo? que eu acho que essa pergunta é fundamental para nós como treinadores de terapeutas, porque se nós não fizermos isso, a gente corre o risco da institucionalização fria, rígida, enrijecida, onde a gente vai atingir talvez a mente dos psicólogos, do terapeuta, mas não a sua alma. E ele sai imaginando que ele faz terapia e ele está cada vez mais distante da arte da terapia. Então, eu queria colocar essa questão, dizer que vou sim no livro indicado do Hillman, nas três últimas páginas, porque tem me interessado em especial qual é a função, qual é a obrigação, qual é o compromisso que nós temos como terapeutas, formadores de outros terapeutas, a estar nessa sintonia profunda com esse papel também, que vai para além do nosso papel na clínica. Muito obrigada. Well, another wonderful question and statement. Um, it's complex and difficult, but uh, I think I've already said a number of things that relate to it. Um, what we don't want to don't want to do, as you were saying, is we don't want to create therapists who are cold and distant and uh, perhaps intellectualize too much or uh, want to be aloof from their clients, distant from their clients. How do we, in other words, how do we train therapists not just to understand Jung and know all the details of his life and all of that, but which itself should be put in, into uh, reflection, you know, one should consider what what is the role of Jung in training, you know, as a what a, what about his words? Um, are are we too rigid and and you know and be sticking to his words instead of maybe discovering our own through him. Um, but another uh, I think another issue is that uh, we as those those of us who do any training, and I say we because I spent 20 years or so just doing a lot of a lot of training with, uh, with all kinds of therapists, not just Jungians, but uh, psychiatrists and others. And I felt that uh, maybe you know from what I said at, early on in this presentation today that I felt it's important to be strong and getting certain ideas across, certain I, certain thoughts across, not to be too uh, wishy-washy ourselves. Um, we have to be strong. And uh, our, our uh, way of being with our trainees will be uh, probably more important than what we say to them. So the 
I, I would say if I were going to have a training program, I'd want the, the trainee trainers to be able to get together and reflect on what they're doing regularly, for one thing. Maybe you already do this, I don't know. I think it would be very important to have maybe even to have some sort of uh, good leadership, to people who could come in and talk to trainers to help bring some of these matters that I brought up today to mind in the training and how it applies to training. Uh, but it's really primarily about who you are, not what you are. You know, it's like, who, who are you as a person in the training? It's, it's like mentorship, you know, like a, a mentor doesn't teach his students so much. There may be some teaching, but the main thing is the intimacy and the modeling, the apprenticeship, that kind of thing, the unspoken, the invisible. All of that is so important in training. And uh, so how do you do that? You do it by uh, becoming as much as you can as a trainer, becoming less, uh, less caught up in the facts and the requirements and the information. In fact, I would say, if I were setting up a training program, I would not use those words ever. I would never talk about any information being given. It's not that we don't inform people somewhat, but the word itself can lead us astray. I never use the word information ever, ever. And there are many other words I don't use, and that's one of them, information. It's not, you know, like I say, yes, we get information, we need to be informed in some ways, but the word itself leads us into this cultural problem where we see, uh, we see our skills as therapists as, as requiring information. I don't think it's true. I think it's primarily in the, the imagination. When I studied, uh, when I studied the uh, uh, Italians of the 15th century, uh, I, I focused on Marsilio Ficino, who was a teacher then. And he said, one of his writings, he said that when you are close to a person, that person lives in you. Very much, he said, like some, when you look in a mirror and you are now living in a mirror. So that, that's a very interesting image, I think. So your student will live in you, but mainly you will live in your student. So who do you want to take up residence in your student? That's, that's one of the big questions, I would say. Are you ready to take up residence in a student and be a, a, a good presence for them? Are you ready for it? You don't have to be perfect, but are you ready? That's a question. How do I get ready? You get ready by becoming a person uh, that has some subtlety and depth, really, and is not, is not swept away by information and all that kind of thing. So if you are that kind of person, then, uh, and you know it, I think you might, you should know it for yourself. Then you, you say, okay, I'm ready to, I'm ready to live in my student now. I'm ready to go and be part of their existence. That's what it is. It's not, it's not, it's not teaching them things. It's uh, taking, but of course, sometimes you get into them, but through your teaching, but the main thing is how they absorb you, not how they absorb information. Obrigado, Berenice. Thomas, é, queria fazer as duas últimas perguntas para você, tá? É, vou fazê-las juntos, okay. juntas, yes. e você, você, você okay. responde do jeito que você quiser. Uh, nós, em agosto, yes. vamos começar um seminário chamado Trapaças de Eros. E nós vamos ler o seu livro, Dark Heroes, Imaginação do Sadismo. Oh. Eu li esse livro há uns 20 anos atrás. Eu acho que eu não entendi nada. E estou relendo agora. 
E esse livro é escandaloso, no melhor sentido da palavra, é um escândalo. Queria te perguntar, primeira pergunta, qual é a história desse livro? Porque é um livro fabuloso, é um livro... A imaginação sadiana, por assim dizer, eu acho ela extremamente contemporânea e atual. Então, eu queria te ouvir um pouco, falar sobre a origem desse livro. Segunda pergunta. Anos 70, Universidade de Siracusa. É, parece que a psicologia arquetípica nasceu lá. Hillman, David Miller, Edward Case, você. É, queria que você falasse um pouco dessa atmosfera dos anos 70 com Hillman, do teu encontro com Hillman da importância dele na sua obra, mas também queria saber as suas discordâncias com ele. Onde é que você e ele divergem? Acho que seria importante para a gente poder ouvir de você essa, essa, ter isso com mais clareza. Vamos começar pelo escândalo. Uh, the Dark Eros. Um, well, uh, the, you ask about how it came to be. I was having, I was a, I was a young, starting, beginning therapist, and I was having some difficulty with dealing with aggression in my clients. Some of them were quite aggressive and uh, toward me, and just in general. Uh, I felt I, I felt very confident in other areas, but when it came to the aggression, I didn't know exactly how to respond. So one day, I can't remember where we were. I was walking down the street with James Hillman and his wife at the time, Patricia Berry, and Rafael Lopez Pedraza and his wife. Uh, and we uh, we were walking down the street, and uh, Rafael and I were together and uh, talking. We had been friends for a long time. And, and uh, I asked him, I, I told him what I thought. I said, I, I'm having trouble with aggression. And he pushed me, shoved me into an alley. He pushed me into an alley. And he put his finger in front of my face and he said, Sada. So I had no idea what was going on. And uh, I went up to his wife, Valerie, and I said, Valerie's Uh, Raphael just told me, Sada, what does that mean? Like, what? I don't know what, he, what he's saying. And she said, I think he wants you to read the Mar Marquis de Sade. So, and Raphael has been a great teacher of mine, you know. I mean, he is so good. He, he was so good. And, and uh, his writing is so valuable, so very, very good. And, and as, as a friend and as someone to, as a, student of his in a way. I never really studied with him, but I mean, as someone in the friendship, you learn a lot. So I went back to my home and I went to the library, a library, and I got, uh, well, first of all, I got every novel written by the Marquis de Sade that I could. And I went to a library that had uh, books that hadn't been published in, in English. They were in French and I, I read about uh, his intention in writing his book, where he said he wanted to explore the hum human experience, especially the dark elements, to see what's going on in these. And I thought, well, that casts a good light on who he is and what he's doing. I mean, a light that I thought was interesting. So I started reading. I read all, everything I could find of Marquis de Sade. And it is, I don't recommend it to anybody. Sometimes people go out and buy his books when I say that. I don't recommend him. He's very dark, very, people get actually sick to their stomach reading him. Um, on the other hand, I felt as a therapist, this is what I should do. I should read these, these things. And I felt right away, I could see it was like mythology. It was not, you don't take that literally. You, you take it like a dream, like dream language and myth, myth mythological language. And I found that what I thought were excellent insights into the darker side of human life, especially to desire and pleasure, eros. 
the erotic. So that's why he called it Dark Eros. And um, I looked for a publisher and my usual publisher, a very big publisher in New York, looked at it and he said, I would never publish this. It's, you know, it's too disgusting. <laughs> and uh, so I, I tried to explain to him, he said, no, it's too disgusting. And it, you, you think it has meaning, but I don't. And uh, so finally, it was, Hillman was the only one left who agreed to publish it. So he published it with Spring Publications. And in the second edition, he got uh, Adolf Guggenbuch Craig to write a preface. And I, I, I don't know, I shouldn't probably say this to you, but I never say this, but I'm, I, I can feel it coming out. Um, I got an excellent review of Dark Eros, really excellent, to a person who really understood what I was trying to do in that book. But it was published in a magazine called Screw. It was not exactly an intellectual magazine. It was a pornographic magazine but I got the best review I've ever had for a book, I think. And that kind of, that's appropriate. You know, it's appropriate somehow, it all fits together. And I know Raphael would be very happy with that. So uh, that's the origins of it. And it, to me, it's a very serious book written for therapists primarily. And it's about trying to find out really, to find a way to, to deal with the ugliness of life and uh, especially ugly desires and not to dismiss them as just being immoral. I don't wanna be a moralist about all that, but to be able to find some insight into it. And Marquita Saad helped me tremendously with that. And I, I'm very, very happy with the book, Dark Eros. Is there something else you wanted? Oh, you wanted me to talk about Syracuse University. I don't know what happened then. There was just a couple of years, three, four years when it was a place. It was, you know, this happens in life. Again, magic. It's, you know, certain places become central and something happens in that place. Something happened in Dublin, Ireland when James Joyce was there. Really very, you know, something happened. And uh, something happened in, uh, in uh, you know, in uh, certain parts of France when the Impressionist painters, you know, just let these things happen in places. And uh, so Southern, I mean, uh, Syracuse University was, uh, was a place where something was going on. Uh, our, my teachers there were David Miller, who you mentioned, and uh, Stanley Hopper, who was uh, interested in mainly in literature and religion, how the two come together. And, um, uh, let's see who else. Houston Smith, who was a specialist in world religions. Um, it, in my, but my classmates were fantastic. Were very, very good, and they've all gone on to be, become real interesting teachers. And so I learned as much from my classmates as from anybody. But David was the one. David Miller was the one who uh, assigned the collective works of Jung. And at the same time, oh no, the next semester he, he assigned uh, the major works of Joseph Campbell to read and all the mythology connected with his books. Uh, and all of that was, was very, very enlightening to me. And I, I went there as an innocent, not knowing anything. And I came out feeling that at least I knew what I had, what my work was and what I had to but more I had to do to prepare myself. I felt very inadequate because I knew so much that I didn't know. It's, it's one way of learning. You discover so many things that you, you should have read long ago or should have had experience of. And that's how I felt going out of it. So I've been continuing to that education ever since. And um, uh, Hillman was, uh, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't see Hillman at Syracuse. Uh, I wrote, we, we, we started a correspondence. We wrote letters, he was in Zurich and he would write articles in various journals in Europe and he would send the copies to me. And so we wrote back and forth and I wrote an article for Spring, the journal Spring on music. I called it musical therapy. I didn't mean music therapy using music and therapy. I meant that therapy itself was musical in some ways. 
I wanted to look at that. And when I first uh, met uh, Hillman, it was at a conference in archetypal psychology in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I remember I was in a crowded room with a lot of people and uh, I saw him and uh, uh, we, we walked toward each other and he came up to me and he said, no violins, that was his first word to me. He meant that in musical therapy, we weren't talking about violins, that was too literal. We're talking about music of life, you know, the music in life. So that was the first thing he said to me, which is a, a statement of deliteralization. You know, no violins. He didn't say hello. He <laughs> didn't say anything like that. No violins. So that was the beginning of our uh, relationship. And um, I'll go on just a little bit more. He, uh, I told him, I said, you're, well, first of all, I was given a job, I, I took a job at a, at a university in Dallas, Texas. And he took a position at the University of Dallas there, another university. And it just so happened then we would be, we lived for five years in the same city, which helped a lot. And we did a lot together and we went out to dinner all the time together, just the two of us. We supported each other a lot and uh, a great deal and worked together, lectured together, things like that. And uh, as far as where I disagreed with him, I think mainly it had to do with uh, matters of the spirit. To me, maybe because I had that background in, the, in monasticism, I, was, I'm, I'm, I am very uh, open to spiritual, you know, bringing spirit into uh, soul work. Very, very, very open to it. And I'm very interested in the world's religions and spiritual traditions, very much so. All of them, I'm not a member of anything. I'm not, you know, it's not that, it's not about membership, it's about uh, something else. But I love the, what I can learn from the traditions. He had no interest in them. He had no interest in, in any of that. He, he just wanted to criticize the spiritual elements. And so, and then he'd look at me and he, if he didn't like what I was doing, he'd say, well, you're just a monk. And, it, you know, with a sneer, you know, just uh, ugliness, you know, you just, he, he would just, not too much, but he would just say, oh, you're, you're just a monk. You don't know what you're talking about. And I felt that he was not monk enough, that he was, uh, he was too negative about spirit. I hated the way he, he wouldn't talk about Christianity, but about Christianism. And I thought that was such a terrible thing to say. You know, why would he pick a fight with Christianity? There was no need. So that was one of the big things. And I'll tell you one other little story. There's so many to tell, but one story was toward the end of his life, he, was, he had his cancer and he knew that there was no, no hope for it. And uh, I was visiting him at his house, just the two of us in the house. And uh, he said to me at one point, out of the blue, not part of a conversation, he said, he said about death, I'm a materialist. Meaning, meaning that there's nothing after death and he just takes death as, death as the end of everything. And I thought to him, I, I didn't say anything to him because they don't want to argue when this man's dying and I don't want to argue with it. But I thought if he had spent his whole life deliteralizing everything and seeing the poetry in every, everywhere and not taking anything as fact. And here he is taking death as a fact. And I thought, what are you, what are you doing? This is so inconsistent with, with everything you've done in your life. Why do you, and why do you have to tell me? Why is it important for you to tell me? Probably because I was the monk. He wanted to really, you know, shock me or something. And, uh, and also, uh, the, he didn't say, I don't think there's anything after death. He said, I'm a materialist. It's another odd thing to say. I'm a materialist. You know, it's like, it's like declaring yourself being something <laughs> totally inappropriate. So that was a kind of ongoing struggle that he and I had throughout. And uh, even now, uh, I find it difficult when I read passages in his writing where he brings that part of him out. I don't, that's not the only thing, but it's something that you might sense from the way I'm talking. It kind of gets me, I, I, uh, gets to me. 
But otherwise, I must say we were very good friends. I loved our friendship. I loved him. Uh, I never had any any difficulty aside from the ones I've mentioned uh, with him. And we had always a good time. We we spent most of our time laughing. Uh, he was he was uh, always 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 on. He was always the therapist looking for soul. He was he never took a vacation. Never for five or 10 minutes. He was always noticing the soul wherever he was. And just playing, walking down the street, whatever we did, he was always, always on that way. And I felt I learned something from him that way too. And I enjoyed it. And as I said, when even when people, we discuss some cases sometimes and we would just laugh, you know, laugh at the human condition, you know, just where we are. And uh, it was a wonderful, warm and happy relationship. Thomas, é, picos e vales não precisam ficar tão separados um do outro, não é? No, no, that's right. That's a very, very wise comment. Yes, and what I just said. That's very good. No, the peaks and valleys are part of the terrain. They uh, and you, you can enjoy going up and down. Thomas. Queria te agradecer pela tua generosidade, pelo, pela tua amabilidade. Para nós aqui, brasileiros do Teaços, que já te lemos tanto, é, é uma grande honra, e eu digo isso em nome próprio aqui, é uma grande honra te receber, te escutar, ser testemunha de tanto conhecimento, experiência, memórias de alma. Nós queremos muito te agradecer. Obrigado. Thank you for having me. I, I enjoy talking to you so much. It's a two-way thing. I like it. So I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Espero que a gente possa, em algum momento, nos conhecermos pessoalmente e te faça um convite. Volte sempre. Volte sempre, que é sempre um prazer te ouvir. Muito obrigado. Thank you, thank you everybody. And thank you, especially Marcus. Pessoal, obrigado pela presença. Novamente um teaços daquele difícil de, de é, dizer alguma coisa, muito emotivo, né? testemunhos, memórias, confissões muito pessoais e um grande ensinamento da alma. Cuidemos de nossa alma, tá? Já deixamos aqui o convite, então, para a semana que vem, né, Lu? Com Vitor, por Deus, psiquiatra, que vai falar sobre o trabalho dele com a doutora Nise, teatro, psiquiatria. Um prazer recebê-los, pessoal. Obrigado. Até a próxima. Tchau, Thomas. Tchau, Thomas.